Welcome to the second video in my video lecture series on harmonic distortion. Today I'm going to di discuss, in general terms, harmonic generation. Where does it come from? So, what I have on screen is a representation of an average plate characteristics curve. This one's a pentode, as is the graphic on screen. Let me clarify a few points on here so we can begin the discussion. So at this point, this is your bias point or the operating grid bias. And at this line, which normally inter intersects the one part of the signal, so here's one full signal from 0, uh, 180 degrees to 360 degrees, so that's one full cycle of the signal. This line, which normally is right up on the zero grid line, is the min minimum negative grid voltage, and this is the maximum grid voltage. If this were to be minus 8 volts, this would be 0 volts, and VG3 would be minus 16 volts. We know the signal is coming in on the load line, and it spans either side of the bias point, so it's, it's going down to 0 volts, back to negative 8 volts, to negative 16 volts. From bias to minimum voltage and bias to maximum negative voltage, the, the voltage is the same. EA and EB are equal. But in this case, given that it's a pentode, uh, IA, the current difference between the bias point and the minimum negative voltage, is greater than or not equal to, would be a better way of saying it, than from the bias point to the maximum negative grid voltage. And because they're not equal, I, IA, EA is not equal to IB, EB, and that difference is why we have a harmonic. It's generating the harmonic because the signal now is asymmetrical. At best, is asymmetrical. So the idea is, let's put a triode in. Maybe that'll solve everything. Well, it's a step in the right direction. The voltage is still the same. The current IA and EB are somewhat equal. If they are dead equal, then there's no distortion. But the problem gets down to they're not quite exactly equal. If they're not exactly equal, it's not an exact replica of the, the output wave is not an exact replica of the input wave. They're going to be slightly different. But this is why you would want to uh, have a triode as a power tube to your amplifier or take a pentode or a tetrode and strap it into triode mode because it almost gets the current either side of the bias point to be somewhat equal therefore reducing harmonics. But this is what's generating the harmonic. So distortion. What we want in a distortion is this. Uh, we want a linear response. For every voltage input, we get a voltage output multiplier. So we get one mil volt in, we want 10 volts out, and as long as the ratio is linear, there's no distortion, but it's not happening. It's not the voltage going out of whack. It's typically the current mismatch, which is causing the distortion, causing the harmonic, causing the problem that you may be hearing and want to get rid of. In this video series, when I uh, talk about linear, it's going to be a straight line. And if I say nonlinear, it's going to mean a curved line. In the mathematics world, uh, nonlinear has a whole different uh, set of rules. I can have discontinuous data, and that would be nonlinear. Uh, I can have a curve and be completely linear. But for this purpose, because the topic we're talking about, uh, vacuum tubes and tube amps, and because the books in the past, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they you'll see them use the, the the expression linear and nonlinear, and what they mean is it's either a straight line or it's a curvy line. If it's a curved line, then we have this uh, red line here. So what happens at low voltage input to a, with an amp that could be theoretically perfectly linear, or one that just operates like it normally does, somewhat linear, uh, at low voltage input, 
uh, they both follow a straight line. But as we go up in voltage, the current mismatch, either side of bias, uh, becomes greater and greater. And when it does, actually what we get is V out is equal to some log term times V in. If it's completely perfect, the V out would be an amplification factor times V in. This is what we want. This is what we get. And this is how it, it operates. It goes along this red line. The good news is it's a log function because log A is equal to E to J omega T and E to J omega T can be expressed in terms, thank you Mr. Euler, uh, sine and cosine or cosine and sine, a real component and an imaginary component. We don't get into that right now but it means we can solve the problem using sines and cosines. So this is what we get. The idea is to make this as less curvy as possible. Unless, of course, you want that curve in there because you want the effect. Uh, blues player wants to be on this line. A stereo person wants to be on the blue line. So what does it mean by nonlinear distortion? In this video series, when we go into actually solving and doing the math for calculating the harmonic distortion, we're going to relate terms of grid to terms of plate. We start with terms of the grid voltage because we're operating on the load line and we set the bias point of voltage, but everything else is going to be done in terms of current. However, this is what we have. So we can equate this in terms of voltage and the voltage uh, is in terms of sine. So the fundamental uh, runs mostly the full width. The, the harmonic is a reduced waveform and shifted possibly, but in this case I'm showing you just nonlinear distortion because this, the shift in voltage can cause a, a dis, distortion. So while we're in sync we still get distortion. So the E out is then equal to this log A, which we don't know what it is, and that's the goal of the video series, is solve for log A, uh, times the, the terms of the equation. So we have the DC component, the fundamental, the secondary, and the third harmonic. But this is also what's occurring at the same time. We get a phase shift. For the fundamental, it comes in with its own phase shift. For the secondary harmonic, it has its own phase shift, and the th third harmonic has its own phase shift. So the grid voltage coming in to the plate voltage coming out is uh, distorted. It has it's asymmetrical, and it's distorted, being and that distortion is being caused by the phase shift. So there's two ways that we can actually uh, come up with a number for the harmonic distortion. One could be completely voltage based. And the other could be voltage and a phase shift. And that's actually a truer number. Again, it sort of gets down to what are you going to do with that number once you get it? Are you just wanting to know whether or not to be alarmed or not, or, or what? Uh, we're again going to need to know something about the angle that each of these phase shifts uh, contribute to the problem so we can then have a negative feedback circuit that's going to mitigate the problem. So this is what it ends up looking like. The V out is equal to log A times all the terms. But each of those terms not only do they have a phase shift, but there's an angle uh, being caused. There's a change in angle along the whole way. It gets really kind of complicated here. And this is why I'm going to touch, uh, talk about the Fourier analysis at the very end because it addresses these terms with the least amount of work on your part. I previously said in other videos and other presentations for 20 lines of code for the Fourier analysis, uh, you can rule the earth. You know, it solves a lot of problems. So the valve was perfect, we would have this. The voltage coming in is 180 degrees going out, so pi would be 180 degrees out. So if, they're, if the current is mismatched, then we would have a symmetry. And if the current was so, uh, or somewhat equal, we, we would be almost equal. If it's not equal, we'll have some asymmetry. So we've got this phase shift here we're going to have to deal with. So if the valve was perfect, there would be no phase shift. 
and actually it'd just be 180 degrees out and it would be an exact replica of what's going in it's an exact replica that's coming out as I discussed in the first video but uh, we're doomed from the start so what do we do with Miller capacitance well you know it's a little itty bitty number so what should we do with it we ignore it well it's contributing to the problem under analysis not in a big way but I want to let you know that the problem doesn't get solved by finding a better tube because no matter what tube you find all tubes will have Miller capacitance what is that well what he proposed is and what he demonstrated is that there is a capacitive value between the plate and the grid and there's a capacitive value between the grid and the cathode and those things contribute and they work together with RG and RA. Now RA is not the resistor up here from the B plus to the dropping resistor. RA is actually the resistive value of the tube plate itself. Now then, <clears throat> depending on the mu of the tube, you, you, you go out and buy a 60 mu or a 100 mu, and some people like buying a 12 AU7 because it's a much lower mu, a much lower amplification, and that helps in a lot of preamps for this very reason. What Miller demonstrated was the mu of the two, the amplification factor times the capacitive value of this one, the capacitor value between the grid and the plate. If, if it's a mu of 60, it makes that capacitor value 60 times bigger. That means if we're looking at picofarads, we could be bumping it up enough to actually make a microfarad change. If it's 100, it gets worse. What that means is anytime you have an RC circuit, you now have an, uh, an attenuation occurring. It'll, it'll bring it down a couple dB, but it's also making a phase shift because the phase shift is equal to the arctan of the reactive value and the resistive value. There's a phase shift, and that phase shift is going to go in right here. Now, it may not be a lot for that particular tube, but because it is a problem, that's the reason a lot of preamps in, some, in stereo systems use a 12AU7 to begin with. You'll try to find a mu of 30, because 30 times that capacitive value is a lot easier to handle than 100 times. So we mitigate the problem. We mitigate the phase shift early on and delay it to something other, further a tube somewhere else like into the power tube uh, it takes more stages at that point but we don't introduce a big phase change right off the bat and that's it so we can't get around Miller capacitance should we be worried about that in our calculations later on in this series no not really not for this video series I may uh, address come back and address this later on but I want to let you know it's present. So a lot of what we do as far as selecting the tube gets down to finding a tube with as low as mu, low as the amplification factor as possible early in the preamp stages as we can get to and then stepwise bring up the amplification later on. So if you're going to take a hit, take it one time. Take it in the power tube, but don't take it in the preamp to the second stage preamp, to the phase shift, to, you know, it just adds up. Now then, <clears throat> why don't they do this with guitar amps? Because they're cheap. Come on, let's face it, they're cheap. Uh, a bunch of garage uh, engineers got together and they just pulled a couple tubes and put it together and away we go. It costs money to make things perfect. So what do you do? You got 12AX7, a mu of 60 to 100 and you stick it into a single uh, tube amp power tube like a you know, 7591 and boom magic happens and it sounds like it does but for a guitar amp that's great for a stereo amp that's bad so uh, it makes a difference here in a stereo amp not so much as a uh, guitar amp depending on what you want to do with that but we're doomed from the start because that phase shift due to Miller capacitance actually takes that, that signal and not only does it shift it off but as I showed in the very first video is acting on the asymmetry and flattening out the curve so that Miller capacitance is 
not allowing this to occur. What's coming in is not going to be an exact replica. It's going to be asymmetrical. It's going to take a hit on the replication of the input signal. Just wanted to put that out there for you to let you know all oh, is not really lost. We can get around that later on. It's normally not a big hit for guitar amps, but it is for stereo amps. So in the next video, I'm going to address design issues. Now that we have a general understanding of uh, distortion, harmonics, and what it's doing to the uh, input wave to the output, uh, there's some considerations we need to make in how, whether or not we're, what tube we're picking and how we have it uh, actually configured in the uh, amplifier. So I'm going to address that in the next video. Thank you for watching.